Good morning. I'm Robert Reese, Acting Director of Winston-Salem Forsyth County Emergency Management. I would like to welcome you to the March 2018 Public Safety News Conference. March is typically known as a transitional period for weather. Often uh, we transition from winter weather to severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. And today, Emergency Management Coordinator, Coordinator Leah Cordell will be presenting some severe weather preparedness techniques. Also, public health experiences a transitional period this time of year as well too, and that will be discussed by Public Health Director Marlon Hunter. He will discuss uh, an update on the current flu epidemic and also present on mosquito control and also a public health fair. Following emergency management will be the Winston-Salem Fire Department and then concluding today's public safety news conference will be the Winston-Salem Police Department. I now turn it over to Emergency Management Coordinator, Coordinator Leah Cordell. Thank you. Good morning. It's that time of year where um, spring is right around the corner. And of course, spring brings uh, severe weather. So that's what uh, we're going to talk about today. Some of the things that you can do for um, to prepare for uh, spring storms that we have is making sure you have um, access to get the severe weather alerts. You can do this by purchasing a NOAA weather radio, which broadcasts continuous weather information audible alert when watches and warnings are issued and can be typically purchased at a, a store for less than $40. You can also uh, sign up for the wireless emergency alerts. Uh, these are free. Um, these are alerts by cell phone or mobile devices. Uh, there's no need to download an app or subscribe to a, ser a service. Just make sure that your phone is set to receive the emergency um, notifications. Alerts typically, they look like a text message when you receive them. You can also purchase, or there are several free apps that you can download from your phone um, that provide real-time uh, National Weather Service alerts. Some are free while others charge a small fee. Also, the emergency alert system and radio and TV warnings are broadcast by cable, uh, satellite and wireless, wireline, uh, services, tune into your local TV, radio stations, and website for details. Uh, in Forsyth County, you can also go to the Forsyth County government webpage as well as the City of Winston-Salem webpage and um, you can receive sign up for notifications that are specifically geared towards Forsyth County and the City of Winston-Salem. I suggest anybody that lives in Forsyth County sign up for both of those notifications. It's important to know the difference in a tornado watch and a tornado warning. Tornado watches or uh, tornadoes are possible. Remain alert, stay tuned. Uh, tomato, tor tornado warnings, um, they have been cited or indicated by weather radio, uh, weather radio radar. Uh, this means take shelter immediately. Severe storms in North Carolina, um, severe thunderstorms must have one of the following hail of at least one inch diameter, winds of 58 miles per hour or stronger, and um, may produce a tornado. Tornado safety is very important. In a structure, go to the interior safe area on the lowest floor, preferably with no windows. Uh, use arms to protect your head and your neck and do not open windows. In a manufactured home, get out immediately. Go to a sturdy nearby building or storm shelter. Mobile homes offer little protection during tornadoes. If you don't have any shelter available, drive to the closest sturdy shelter. If your car is hit by flying debris, get to a low lying area and cover your head. Do not get under an overpass or a bridge. Lightning safety. When thunder roars, go indoors. No place outside is safe during thunderstorms. If no building is available for shelter, get inside 
a metal topped vehicle. Stay inside for at least 30 minutes after the last clap of thunder. When inside, stay off corded phones and don't use any electrical equipment. Do not use sinks, baths, or faucets. Stay away from doors and off porches. Each year in the United States, 400 people are struck by lightning and 60 people are killed on average by lightning. Flash flood safety tips. Move to higher ground when a flash flood warning is issued. Any possibility of a flash flood exists. Do not wait for instructions. Do not walk through moving water. Do not drive into flooded areas. Do not ignore traffic barricades that close off flooded roadways. Do not camp or park along streams, rivers, or creeks. It only takes 18 inches of flowing water to carry most vehicles away. Six inches of fast moving water can knock over an adult. Last but not least, um, make sure that your uh, family has an emergency plan so your family may not be together during an emergency. Make sure everyone knows how to create, get to a safe place, contact each other, get back together and respond and be, be flexible. And make sure you have a, um, your emergency disaster preparedness kit prepared for each member of your family. You need to have a minimum of three days a week um, is the best option. You can also go to our readyforsythe.org uh, website and get uh, various information on preparing for disasters. And don't forget to lo like us on social media. If you have any other questions, here's our contact information. Is there any questions? If there's no questions, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Director Hunter. Good morning, everyone. Always glad to be here. I'm delighted to be here uh, to speak with all of you uh, today about uh, a couple of topics that are significant to uh, the public health department. As all of you know, we have had a challenging uh, flu season uh, around the entire country. And so I'll give you some um, current and up-to-date uh, numbers and provide a little history about uh, the flu and where we've come from. Typically, our flu season starts uh, around uh, October and will run through May. And the peak uh, of our flu season, uh, we will tend to see sometime um, from uh, November uh, through March. Our uh, flu season, uh, as you know, is, and, and as we think about the influenza virus, is a very contagious uh, respiratory illness, uh, spreads uh, mainly through uh, airborne droplets, through coughing and sneezing. The flu season, you know, as I mentioned, uh, the time frame from which it lasts, but from a historical perspective, and as you take a look at pandemics, I, I thought this uh, was significant and would be good to share. Back in 2009, uh, we uh, had to uh, live through the swine flu, and it was responsible for approximately 500,000 deaths around the United States. Back in 1968, uh, H3N2, uh, which is a strand um, uh, that uh, is the strand that's responsible uh, for the many deaths we've seen this flu season. Uh, back in 1968 was responsible for about 1 million deaths worldwide. And then on down to 1918, 100 years ago, uh, we can see the Spanish flu that was responsible for 50 million deaths worldwide. So and I think it's just significant to just see historically, you know, where we've come from so that we can think about the advances in science and medicine and as well as uh, from uh, where we have evolved from a vaccine and preventable disease perspective. The seasonal flu is also responsible for uh, large numbers of hospitalizations each year. Uh, and so we see on average 
around the United States uh, of about 310,000 hospitalizations. Uh, the deaths tend to range, and we have uh, collected information and data on around a five or six year rolling average, um, anywhere from between 12 to 56,000 people each year. Um, and also, at, uh, for the last bullet, you can see that uh, some folks are at a greater risk for contracting the flu than others. Uh, typically, we know that our children and the elderly are more vulnerable uh, for contracting the flu, and as well as those individuals with pre-existing health conditions, in particular, uh, upper respiratory uh, in nature. But recently, you know, over the past couple of years, if you've taken note of the news, we have heard of very healthy young folks, um, you know, dying from the flu. In North Carolina, um, as we uh, look back, of course, right now, um, as of February 24th, uh, our state uh, has seen 258 uh, flu deaths. Uh, week ending uh, March 3rd, we are still seeing widespread flu across the entire state. Uh, our state lab um, tested uh, 22 samples, 14 of those returned positive, which kind of gives us from a percentage perspective uh, about 64% of those tests are coming back positive. Uh, Hospital-based uh, public health epidemiologist uh, tested roughly 1,800 tests, and around 300 of those tests are, have come back positive. So you can see, you know, right now, even though we are on the, de the decline, uh, we still see widespread uh, flu, and it's important to just take note. Um, um, and here again, from a historical perspective over past seasons, uh, last year, we had 218 deaths around the state of North Carolina, uh, and in 2015, 2016, we saw as low as 59 deaths. So the flu uh, is unpredictable, as you can see uh, by the numbers. And so that is why it is important for me and all of the health directors around the state um, to continue to come and try every to do everything we can to raise awareness about the importance of of getting a flu shot. In Forsyth County, in particular, uh, for the 2017-2018 uh, year, we right now have seen seven deaths. I don't have the, the latest information and data to know whether or not those numbers have increased, but at least for right now, we've had seven uh, that are attributable to this flu season. And if you take a look down at 2014-2015, we had 14 deaths in Forsyth County. Moving right along, um, we always want to remind everyone uh, uh, to get a flu. It's still our best uh, protection. And uh, we want folks to pr practice prevention. And so if you're sick, stay home. If you're sick and if you're children, are sick, try to do everything you can to keep them home. You've also heard that many schools around the country have had to close because of large uh, numbers of children, you know, coming to school uh, sick uh, with the flu. Um, and we also uh, uh, want to encourage folks to wash their hands. As simple as that sounds, it is preventable, and public health is about prevention and education. And so we want to encourage you folks to just take time to do that simple thing a couple of times a day. Wash your hands, if you can, with warm, uh, soapy water, and it will certainly help minimize the spread of the flu. And if you find yourself with the flu and the doctor prescribes antivirals, please take them because they will shorten the length of time you know you will suffer and, uh, and as well as lessen the symptoms that, that you may experience. Who should receive the flu? vaccine, um, everyone older than six uh, uh, months of eight, uh, six months old, and, uh, and then for those seniors that are 65 years of age or older, we have a high dose vaccine available 
you know, especially for them, is, uh, since they are a little more vulnerable uh, to, uh, to contracting a new, uh, having that flu turn into uh, a, an even more significant upper respiratory issue like pneumonia, uh, we have a high dose available for those 65 or older that tends to work very well. Where can I get the flu? Still at the Forsyth County Health Department for free, you know, and, and um, we don't really think about it or we think, you know, that our flu here again shot is insignificant, but we still offer those for free. You can now get them uh, at your local drug stores or, or from your primary care uh, physicians. Is our flu vaccine effective? Overall, as we take a look at uh, the state and federal data, uh, typically we, we can see that our flu vaccines on average are around 30% effective. This year, you know, based on the latest uh, information and data from the Centers for Disease Control, it looks like the vaccine is around 36% uh, effective for this flu season and for children around 60 59% uh, effective. So what that means is if you are a child, you are 60% less likely to contract the flu if you get the flu vaccine. And if you are an adult, you're nearly 40% less likely to contract the flu. If you do, uh, even if you have taken the flu shot, just like the antivirals, it will shorten the length of time that you will have the flu. So um, folks always ask the question, you know, well, you know, why should we, you know, why should we get the flu uh, shot if it's not as effective? Well, some protection is better than no protection and the benefits outweigh the risk. And so I would rather have some level of protection than absolutely none at all. So uh, keep that in mind as we uh, move closer to the end of this flu season. And, uh, and move towards spring, which leads me to my next topic of conversation. In your local public health department, as you know, we, we take a look at a wide range of, uh, of potential communicable and infectious diseases to include mosquitoes and all kind of fun stuff. And so this uh, mosquito season, um, uh, which will last typically from June through September, uh, we want everyone to uh, work together uh, to minimize mosquito breeding sites. It seems like uh, every year for the past 10 years or every other year, we've seen a new emerging or re-emerging disease or threat. And, um, and so we, we saw a resurgence of West Nile virus a few years ago. And uh, so it seems like these diseases don't quite go away. That is why uh, we uh, have had uh, a mosquito control program at the Forsyth County Public Health Department that has been funded very well by the Forsyth County government. And I think all of us as uh, citizens in Forsyth County should be proud, you know, that our, our elected officials are working to keep programs that seem less significant in place. Um, and so we've certainly made our case in the Public Health Department to make sure we keep programs like this funded and I'm certainly glad that we have. And so it is a community effort. And uh, because um, even though you may keep your yard clean of trash and debris, your next door neighbor may be, may be breeding mosquitoes for you. And so we want everyone to uh, use the tip and toss method. So if you have uh, a bird bath or a dog or, or or a cat a water bowl outside, be sure at least once every two or three days to empty those because they become mosquito breeding sites. You know, thousands of mosquitoes, believe it or not, can breed in something as small as a bottle cap. So I encourage all of you to give us a call at the health department and come by and, and take a look and learn about, you know, uh, what we are doing uh, with regard to mosquito control and the efforts that uh, we put in place to make sure our community is uh, safe. And I think you will be enlightened if you decide to take the opportunity to do so. Clean up around your home, clean up leaves, gutters um, as well. And um, that should help us reduce the spread 
of mosquitoes. Wear appropriate clothing when you're outside, uh, and uh, typically at dusk and at dawn, um, preferably long sleeves. We want you to use the appropriate insecticides as well as repellents uh, that contain DEET. And if you are traveling, please take the time to go to the Centers for Disease Control website and read the travel advisories, especially if you're going out side of the country so that you can be made aware of outbreaks and patterns and warnings that exist in other countries and other parts uh, of the U.S. If you have any questions or concerns, uh, please contact the Division of Environmental Health uh, at the Health Department. And uh, this presentation, as well as all of the information I've shared with you today, uh, you can find on the website. And now, finally, I want to share, because we are also uh, at the Health Department are responsible for um, you know, tracking uh, health outcomes in the community. And so we want to, um, as often as we can, work to try to w raise awareness about health outcomes in our community and find ways to address health beyond just clinical access to care. Uh, other ways, you know, beyond just going to the doctor. So we are holding a free community health fair during public health week on April 2nd and 3rd. Uh, we uh, have many uh, sponsors and partners um, and uh, we are gonna host this event at Winston-Salem State University um, and, but one good thing I want to take note of before I take a seat is that at this community health fair, we are going to try our best to model, uh, health using the arts. And, uh, and I think that is a new and innovative way to think about how we address the social determinants of health. And, uh, so we are going to have a play, um, put on by a playwright here in town who will uh, model, and, that, and in that play, they will model the uh, impact that infant mortality has on family and our communities through play. And I think that's, uh, um, it, it will be enlightening and, and, and a great uh, model uh, for us to continue to use and for all to at least come out and take advantage of and learn from. And then finally, we're gonna have folks uh, working with us uh, using the Venture Cafe model. I'm sure you all have heard of uh, the Venture Cafe Winston-Salem. We are going to have a similar model at this health fair whereby we can have our partners and grassroots organizations there with us to talk about the programs and services that they offer and how they make an impact on the social determinants of health. Are there any questions? Thank you. And next up is the fire department. Good morning, I'm Trey Mayo. I'm the fire chief for the city of Winston-Salem. Just a few announcements from me. I uh, wanted to let everyone know that we opened our hiring process Monday morning and uh, we are hiring for the position of firefighter. So those of you who are within the sound of my voice, even if you are not interested in becoming a firefighter, if you know someone who is, please direct them to the city of Winston-Salem Human Resources webpage and over on the right side of that webpage, the very first thing that you will be able to select from is apply for a job, and you can drill down into uh, selecting the, the uh, firefighter position, and it takes you to an electronic application. There, you don't have to worry about getting something to the post office. Um, it, it can all be done uh, electronically at your pleasure uh, from, a, from a computer or other electronic device. Um, we are particularly uh, looking to increase the number of applicants or the number of applications we receive from uh, fire service minorities, particularly African Americans, Hispanics, and females, uh, females being the number one uh, minority in the fire service nationwide. Uh, that, jo the, that job uh, application will be available until midnight on April 29th but I would encourage folks who are interested to not wait uh, in case you have to uh, secure documents uh, and other things from uh, states where you have lived uh, prior. Uh, you know, people move around from state to state. Sometimes they have to 
to procure documents from, from past addresses. Uh, the other thing I have is uh, Friday morning at 10 a.m. at the Rhodes Conference Center at Forsyth, Forsyth Tech uh, on Miller Street, we'll be having our annual awards and recognition ceremony where we recognize those who have been promoted uh, in the past year and also recognize those individuals who have been involved in uh, successfully saving the life of a sudden cardiac arrest patient uh, and in participating in other uh, particularly unique acts of heroism. Uh, and I'm going to now turn it over to Fire and Life Safety Educator Sabrina Stowe. She's going to talk about some spring safety tips as folks are getting out and cleaning up around their houses. Good morning. I um, just want to go over a few things. Um, most of this seems to be common sense knowledge, but we do like to make sure that we remind people from time to time different things that they need to look out for or take care of in their homes. First of all, we like to start in the kitchen. Just a few things, just to do a safety overview, if you will. Um, just checking your home for any type of fire or safety hazards that you may have or may not even be aware of. Definitely want to make sure that you're keeping things um, clean in the kitchen. You want to make sure you're keeping any type of grease or oil containers off the cooktop, anything that can spark a fire, start a fire, towels, dish, dishcloths, pot holders, that type of thing. Even your grocery bags, a lot of times people will come and you know sit those on the cooking surface that may get turned on accidentally and can create a fire. Um, definitely want to have a fire extinguisher in your home, in your kitchen. Know where to place those. If you need assistance with that, please contact us here at the fire department and we can assist you with that. More importantly, make sure you know how to work the fire extinguisher. We do offer a fire extinguisher class for individuals, for groups, to teach you how to use that properly and also teach you when to not use it and to just get out of the home and contact the fire department. Matches, lighters, that type of thing. Make sure you keep those stored high and away from children that can get to those. Don't want them to get curious and, and, and start a fire accidentally as well. Also want to mention the fire suppression canisters. We talk about those a lot. This is a picture of a recent save from those devices. That was um, MLK a um, couple weeks ago. And as you can see, that, that fire was diverted, um, preventing you know, a, a much larger disaster. That powder is just going to be um, produced at the sign of a fire or once that flame hits the tip of that canister, it's going to release that powder. And you see that's just going to be an easy cleanup for someone. Do want to mention we still have um, a good supply of those devices available. We want residents to give us a call here at 336-773-7900 if they're interested in getting those canisters. Only required to have a vent cover over your cooktop, and, and we can make those available to our residents. And there is no cost involved. Just give us a call. We will send our on-duty firefighters out to install those for you. In the bathroom, want to make sure that you're remembering to not leave the dryer fan on. Those can create a lot of heat. Um, those can cause fires. A lot of times people turn those on and they forget and they leave the home. Um, want to make sure that you're turning those off. Other little safety tips, make sure you have a grab bar or skid resistant mats in your home, in your bathroom and use those, not just have to be elderly um, to need those or want those in your home. In the laundry room, make sure that you're not using uh, or that you are using a dryer with a lint filter. People sometimes forget those. Um, you want to make sure they're not only using those, but you're cleaning out that lint filter from time to time, making sure that you're not creating another fire hazard with you know anything that has heat and has some combustible materials around it, near it, those can cause some you know, fire hazards. If you have a gas dryer, make, make sure that you have those inspected by a professional. Make sure the line is, is connected, it's intact, that there are no leaks. You want to be very careful about that. Also, with the dryer, you just want to think about that just as you would a space heater in your home. You don't want to leave your dryer running while you're asleep. You don't want to leave your dryer running while you're out of the home. So make sure that you're being careful about that. Also, detergents, pods, anything like that that kids can get into, you want to make sure that you're keeping those um, stored up high and, and away from children. 
the garage, a lot of times we don't think about that as being part of our home, but it is connected to your home. You want to make sure that it's, it's free from any type of clutter. You want to make sure that any accelerants that you have in there are stored in the proper type containers, that they are stored um, away from anything that's going to be combustible. You have tools in there. You may have lawn equipment. So you want to make sure that those things are stored properly. If you can put those things in a shed away from your home, that would be a, a better source. A uh, better solution and also keep a fire extinguisher in your garage. Just in general, want to make sure that you're testing those smoke alarms once a month. You have the traditional um, batteries in those smoke alarms. You want to change those at least twice a year. If you need smoke alarms, we do still have those available for residents to contact us and we can get those installed for you as well. Look for tripping hazards in your home, extension cords, rugs, um, things that are left on your stairs. Make sure that you're not creating an environment for accidents. If you're taking medications, make sure that you keep those in a central location. If in the event that you need to call for emergency help, it's good for us to know, you know what medicines you're taking, where those medicines are located. Keep a list of those written on your refrigerator um, because our first responders you know, can react a lot more efficiently if they have that information available to them. Keep your emergency contacts somewhere where our emergency responders can, can see those. On a refrigerator, written down somewhere, but make sure that it's visible for the firefighters to see that. Make sure that your house number is visible from the street. Um, look for you know overgrown bushes, that type of thing. We want to be able to make sure that we can get to your location as quickly as possible. Also may want to consider taking a hands-only CPR class. We offer that class as well, um, free of charge. We will come to you and, and show you how that process works. There is no mouth-to-mouth -mouth contact, so this will be something that you can do as part of your church organization, homeowners association, any type of civic group. Um, we would be glad to come out and, and, and teach you all how to do that. Anyone have any questions for me? Thank you. Next, we will have um, Assistant Chief Miles from our Winston-Salem Police Department. Good morning. I'm Assistant Chief Natasha Miles. On behalf of the men and women of the Winston-Salem Police Department, I would like to welcome you to the March 2018 Public Safety News Conference. Before I share upcoming events, I would like to thank the men and women of the Winston-Salem Police Department for all that you do each day and for risking your lives on a daily basis. The upcoming events on, as part of the National Poison Prevention Week, the Winston-Salem Police Department will be conducting a citywide operation medicine drop on Saturday, March 24th from 3 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. The drop-off locations will be at our four public safety locations. The Public Safety Center here at 725 North Cherry Street and each of our district offices. District 1, 7836 North Point Boulevard. District 2, 1539 Walltown Street. District 3, 2394 Winter Haven Lane. At that time, we'll be accepting pills, pharmaceutical powders, and blister packs, etc. We will not accept liquids, gel, creams, needles, biohazard materials, or any household chemicals. Our Citizen Police Academy begins Thursday, April 5th, 2018, and ends on June 28th, 2018, every Thursday evening from 6.30 to 9 p.m. Any additional information on this city uh, police academy can be located on our website at www.wspd.org. And also, the April Coffee with a Cop will be held on Saturday, April 14th, at the West Salem Civic Club at 1010 Hutton Street from 9 a.m. until 11 a.m. Any questions? Next, you will hear from members of our K-9 unit, uh, Sergeant Barrier, Corporal Perkins, and Corporal Neal, and that we will be 
followed by Lieutenant Cartwell on unsolved homicides. Hey, good morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, my name is Neil Barrier. I'm Sergeant over the K-9 unit. Um, I want to speak to you this morning about some exciting changes we've had in the last uh, couple months with the K-9 unit. Um, back in uh, December, uh, Corporal Perkins' dog actually reached retirement age, and a few months later, Corporal Neal's dog reached retirement age. Um, as you can see right here coming in is one of our newest K-9 handlers, uh, or K-9s, uh, K-9 baddie of Corporal Perkins. What we'd like to do today is uh, introduce Corporal Perkins and his new K-9 uh, baddie. He started training back in December and has about two more weeks will be finished up. Uh, also, Corporal Neal will be um, presenting his canine. And we had a kind of unique idea we presented to the public. We uh, listed their uh, suggestions on naming the canine this time. Uh, Corporal Neal will go into the actual selection process on the name of the dog and uh, how we did it. Um, there's no other questions. I'll turn it over to Corporal Perkins and let him give you a little background on Batty and what he can do. Good morning, um, Corporal Perkins, Michael Perkins. This is K-9 Batty, which is spelled B-A-D-Y. Batty is a dual purpose K-9, which is locating narcotics and he tracks. Um, Batty came to this department and we started training in December when my first K-9 retired in October. Uh, Batty is from the Czech Republic. He speaks Dutch. English, and I speak to him in German. Uh, Batty is 18 months old, and he enjoys working. He's motivated, uh, very happy to be here in the city, very interested in a lot of things. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. <laughs> Um, all the basic ones, so you have sit, down, stay, come, um, up for jumping. Of course, you have searching commands for searching for drugs, search commands searching for people, uh, search commands searching for articles, things that are thrown maybe by a suspect. Um, so all basic stuff. Is this the canine the uh, public help man? No, so Batty was one of the first new ones we have. My dog retired due to age and he had some medical issues. So we started training with my dog first. And then once my dog began training, that's when K9 Cash started looking into retirement. Um, so unfortunately, he was already named prior to that. So his name. <laughs> Good morning, folks. My name is Gary Neal, and I, too, am a corporal with the K-9 Division here at the Winston-Salem Police Department. I'm going to speak to you about the dog that the public has uh, graciously assisted me in naming. Um, so my dog also is a dual-purpose dog. He does narcotics, tracking, suspect apprehension, article finds, um, similar to um, what Corporal Perkins was mentioned. Picture of... Uh, what was his kennel name was Eddie. So this is just a picture of him working while we were up um, through the selection process up at uh, Shallow Creek Kennels up in Pennsylvania. Um, again, his name uh, kennel name was Eddie E D Y. Um, he's a 17 month old Belgian Malinois, also from the Czech Republic. And listed on here, his favorite toy at the time was a ball and a rope. And uh, just like a child, it changed within two days. It's a tennis ball. Um, commonly used uh, training aid to 
get the dogs to focus on, on what we have them doing. Um, just going to go through a little bit on how we uh, came up with the name. Um, so we presented the uh, option out to the public through both the Winston-Salem Police Department and the city's uh, website, Multimedia. Um, there were 400 plus name suggestions that came in all across the United States. Um, not just through social media, but calls and texts and emails. Um, the naming process came through from Monday, March 5th through uh, closed uh, at the evening of Thursday, March 8th. Uh, we sat down, went through the, the list um, based off of all those names and came up with the name uh, this past Friday. Um, but you'll see on here, obviously, it was uh, the public was quite interested in assisting with the naming. We had 10,000 plus impressions on Twitter, 2.7 thousand video views, uh, 50 replies or comments, and 11 retweets. Instagram had 1,295 video views, 111 comments, and Facebook had 10.1 thousand reached with uh, 4.9 thousand video views, 429 reactions, and 222 comments and 23 shares. Now, this was just through the city. My personal uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram blew up as well did my uh, texting and emails from coworkers, family, and friends. Um, so again, this was just an exciting opportunity to allow the uh, um, public uh, the assistance in helping us name. So, I know nobody's here really to see me. They're here to find out what the name is of the dog. So um, our final decision uh, was Canine Copper, and I'll tell you how we came up with that name. Um, we had, of the top five um, vote getters was Sarge, S-A-R-G-E, Winston, of course, for Winston-Salem, Dash, um, Copper, and um, we also had multiple um, requests to name them after a fallen officer. Um, just some of my favorites, in addition to those, uh, we had Constable Scratchington, James Earl Bones, Sniffy McDruggan Stuff, J.K. Grawling, and uh, two uh, ones that were multiples that I'm assuming were from family and friends that knew me very well were Gator and Tango of the movie Tango and Cash. And just so you know, my previous partner that retired uh, just uh, March 4th was named Cash. So that's where we get that from. However, um, based on one of the comments um, from two different people, we had uh, one of our senior office assistants, Jessica Abney, and another person on Instagram, which was R-O-S-O-H-A-C, suggested copper. And uh, based on the, the following statement from Ms. Abney, um, copper for multiple reasons, his color, his job, me and cop, short for copper, and uh, copper was used to make pennies, which is a form of currency, which reminded her of cash, my, pr my previous partner. So based on that, um, we are going to name the dog copper. Are there any questions that I can answer? Okay. Um, the handlers themselves have the option of uh, purchasing the dog back from the city. We sign a contract and we take uh, full custody of the dog at that time and it is turned over to uh, that handler. Um, and that has happened with every police dog here with the Winston Sound Police Department. The, the question was um, asking how or where do the uh, dogs go once they've retired? Um, and yes, ma'am, um, mine has uh, currently taken refuge on the floor in the house and is uh, enjoying multiple toys and the freedom to interact with our family pets that we have at the house. Any other questions? How do you adjust the canine from once he or she goes into retirement? How do you adjust uh, him from the day to day life to the day to day life? Well, as you know, it's only been, uh, it's been less than two weeks since Cash has retired, so um, I'm still going through the motions of that. However, it's just, it, you know, um, the first, what I've been told the first month or two is, is a little rough on him. Um, my family tells me he stands at the back door waiting for me whenever I walk out. He thinks I'm going to disappear for the day, especially when he hears the car fire up. He knows that noise. Um, but it's just it's just that integration more into the family. Before that, they're a working dog. They're not really a part of, they're a part of the family, but they're not a day-to-day -day part to where they interact with everybody. 
Um, and then I think that socialization and mixture back into the family, like I said, with our dogs and, and uh, my children help take care of them, um, helps to lessen the burden and the stress of, of what goes on. Um, well, I came up with the idea um, once I was told that I was going to get a second dog. I, I've seen on multiple social medias across the United States where the police department has reached out to the community to ask for help with that. Plus, uh, with my first dog, um, before I even knew who he was, I had a couple names that I had thought that I might want to go through. Um, but Cash just was his kennel name, and I thought it was really cool. Um, but I, I also wanted something different. I, I wanted this dog to be different than my first dog. And um, you just never know what kind of name you're going to get. I, they just come up with names when these dogs are born and give it to them just so that they know which dog that they're dealing with. Sometimes you just get the same old, uh, you know, repeated names over and over. I just wanted something different, something um, to also spark the interest in the public to show them, hey, you know, we're police officers, we have dogs, but you know, it, this is a fun part of the job, and I wanted it to, to be even funner with, with that part of the public self. Any other questions? And again, as Sergeant Barrier said, after uh, the conclusion of this conference, we'll be able to have some pictures and any further questions out front under the public safety arch. Thank you. morning. I'm uh, Mike Cardwell. I'm a lieutenant in our criminal investigation division. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about an unsolved homicide from uh, 2016. Uh, the Winston Police Department uh, is releasing a video about the 2016 unsolved homicide of 19-year-old Theron uh, Brannon. Uh, this video will also be shown on the city's TV uh, channel and uh, YouTube channels. Early on the morning of Christmas Eve 2016, Theron Thomas Brannon III was killed in a hail of gunfire after opening the kitchen door of his house. Brannon, who was 19 and was called Trey, had a five-year-old daughter and a promising future. Trey was a pretty smart kid. He um, graduated in the top five of his class in uh, 2015. He was one of the nominees for valedictorian. He wanted to take some time off of school first and then go back in. So he started working. The company that he was working for realized he had good leadership skills and were going to send him to Germany to train at their main company so he could come back and they put him into management training. They were going to send him to school, A&T for mechanical engineering. About 2 a.m. on the morning of Christmas Eve 2016, the Brannon family heard gunshots outside their house on Nancy Lane on the city's south side. Angela Brannon says the family went outside briefly to check for damage to their house and cars. Trey stayed up after his mother went back to bed. Around three-ish, there was a knock on the door. It woke me up. I heard Trey's voice um, just, OK, OK, that's cool. And he shut the door. Well, I came down the hall and I said, what, you know, who was that? What's going on? He said, oh, just some kid. He said he got jumped. Um, and he thinks he dropped his phone in our yard. And he just wanted to let us know that he was in the yard looking for his phone. I went back down and got in the bed. Five minutes later, there was another knock on the door. My mind, I'm thinking either the kid found his phone he gave up and he'll come back tomorrow. Thank you, I'm leaving, something. But when I heard the door open, I heard the gunshots. I came running towards the kitchen where it had happened. And there were just bullets going everywhere, it was just gunshots. Was going everywhere. Trey, Trey was sitting in the kitchen chair. And he couldn't talk. He, he was grunting like he was in pain. Um, I was trying to find He had a dark shirt on so I couldn't see anything. And I was 
Trey, are you okay? Trey, talk to me, tell me what's going on, what's going on? He couldn't say anything, he just kept grunting. <laughs> he was in pain. And finally, he, he looked, <laughs> looked me in the eye and he said, I love you. <laughs> and that was the last thing I heard from my son. Investigators determined that more than 20 shots were fired from the front yard of the house next door. We don't have a motive for this killing. Uh, all indications, you know, Theron was a good kid, uh, never been in trouble, nobody mad at him that we know of. Uh, this is possibly a case of mistaken identity. Somebody out there is know something, you know what I'm saying? Somebody knows something. And, you know, I don't wish it on anybody to have to go through anything like this, but, I mean, you can see. Somebody should help us out. I know in the street it's considered snitching, but when it's a murder, unnecessary, no motive, no anything, that's not considered snitching, that's considered honor. <laughs> you get more respect for being honorable and for keeping information like this and not allowing justice to be served. His daughter deserves it. His brothers deserve it. He deserves it. I deserve it. If you or someone you know has information about the death of Theron and Brandon, please call Crime Stoppers at 727-2800. You do not have to give your name. If your information leads to an arrest, you may be eligible for a cash reward. Uh, I'd like to take an opportunity to thank our city's marketing and communications department for their continued uh, assistance in making these videos and for reaching out to the community to help us uh, solve these crimes. Um, I will be able to uh, answer some questions about this case uh, if, if there are any questions now. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the question being asked um, by a media a person is whether or not a prior incident on the same night of this homicide has been able to be established to be connected to this investigation. Um, we are continuing to investigate all leads that we have, and we have received leads uh, in this case uh, that are helping to towards the solving of the, of the case. Uh, but we still need the community to, to step forward and provide us with additional information. Uh, our detectives work long and hard on these cases, uh, but again, our number one tool in these cases uh, is information that we receive from the community. Is there any other questions about this case? Yes. And, and just to keep this uh, this conference on, on a time schedule, I do have a packet for the media that will highlight the specific information that have already been said in the video. So I'll provide that to you at the end of the conference just to keep us on schedule. Uh, the question was uh, uh, asked by the media about specific details that have already been outlined in the video, uh, and that I have prepared a packet to provide them with that information at the end of the conference. Are there any other questions? Uh, these, these videos are very helpful. Uh, we have been uh, uh, showcasing or, or trying to showcase each case individually uh, this past year so that the, uh, the investigation itself gets the attention from the community and the focus on it. Uh, one of our more successful videos uh, this past year reached approximately 24,000 viewers uh, on, through our uh, internet uh, posting on our YouTube channel. Uh, the time and, and uh, manpower that it would take to reach that many people uh, in, a, in a time frame this could be into that viewer would be, it would be just near impossible to reach those uh, type of uh, uh, community members. Uh, so that's very successful. We do receive tips um, that help us solve these cases um, and, and still look towards our community members to help us solve these cases. Are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Assistant Chief Miles again. Thank you. If there are no further questions, this will conclude the March 2018 Public Safety News Conference.
Good morning. I'm Robert Reese, Acting Director of Winston-Salem Forsyth County Emergency Management. I would like to welcome you to the March 2018 Public Safety News Conference. March is typically known as a transitional period for weather. 